Boils and ghouls, lock your doors and strap yourselves in. From Los Angeles, California, Bloody Disgusting presents the Boo Crew Podcast. Horror news, commentary, reviews, interviews, and more. With your hosts, Lauren and Trevor Shand and Leone D'Antonio. Go ahead, scream. That's all we need. Another victim crawls onto the gurney for a Boo Crew autopsy. Joining the Boo Crew via the Speakeasy Studio is a great friend of the show. She's a truly gifted, intoxicatingly compelling storyteller and creator. She's starting countless feature shorts and TV projects, including the Emmy-nominated Ghost Whisperer, Numbers, Castle, and Mob City. Her work constructing this brilliant symphony of tension in the unforgettable role of Maddie in one of the most visceral cinematic experiences of all time, 2016's multi-award-winning Hush, has become one of the pillars of genre filmmaking and also serves as a tremendous showpiece to her virtuistic writing skills, command of thought-provoking narrative, and impeccable attention to detail. She has also appeared in 2013's award-winning Oculus, the multi-award-winning Ouija Origin of Evil, Gerald's Game. In 2018, she gave us Theodora Crane on the terrifying and soul-melting The Haunting of Hill House. It has become known as one of the top-rated shows in history, accruing over 10 awards and 32 nominations, and scores of new devoted fans getting pulled in by the whimsy of its many mysteries every day. In Theodora, she gave us an icon of strength, a vessel of compassion, and a symbol of courage and love. In her body of work, in following her heart, and putting all of herself into this craft that is intertwined with her essence, our guest has really already managed to create this incredible legacy that will be talked about, meditated upon, enjoyed, and shared forever. It is truly a gift to experience. Her latest work is in Mike Flanagan's stunning new masterpiece, A Haunted Prayer on Love and Mortality, The Haunting of Bly Manor. Available now on Netflix, we are honored to welcome the amazing Kate Siegel. Yeah! 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 Me out with your introductions. Your introductions. It just, I, they blow my mind. I'm blo- I, I don't even know what to say about that. Like, you blow know. our mind. Well, again, again, thank you so much for taking the time to be with. I mean, we miss you guys so much. Just yeah. in general, how, like, how the hell have you been doing? You know, um, I think we can all honestly say that we're struggling. It's just, it's a lot. Um, a lot of different things. I am by far one of the luckiest people I know in terms of being able to work, being able to be with my kids. Neither of my uh, younger kids are school aged. And so I don't have to do any of the distance learning. So um, I try just to like really focus on all the good things and not all of the time I want to be eating Triscuits and crying. <laughs> right. <laughs> I don't know what I have to do. What's the state of affairs then right now concerning where you guys are at in production of the new project, Midnight Mass, with everything going on? We are up in Vancouver shooting right now. And that's a whole new game as well because um, Netflix is right on top of it in terms of safety. And we all feel really protected and safe and grateful. We're getting tested and the crew is in full PPE, which means face shield, KN95 masks, our hair and makeup teams wear surgical gowns. But a lot of that um, like independent film feel where you get to talk to people and get to know your grips and you get to know your camera operators and the cast can gather and chat, that's all gone. And so it becomes this sort of more focused clinical way of storytelling, which I think for the show we're making is fabulous because it has created our little, our tiny community, which is what the show is about. It has created a deep intimacy very quickly with us because we're the only ones who aren't wearing masks. And so really we have this experience that we're all having together. And um, in a very small way, it is like, it is like we all grew up on a fishing island together. Right. And speaking of that, like people, are, people are using that. There's a fishing island, I guess, that they've built in Steveson outside of Vancouver. It's become like a tourist attraction out there. Dude, the the set design, the art direction of this show is insane. People are going to lose their minds. But yeah, they keep building tiny towns and turn and burning them down. So I don't know. Wow. <laughs> burn them down. No, wow. I know there's not much you could say about it. But can you at least yeah. for those who don't know or perhaps haven't discovered it yet, can you lead them a little bit on that Easter Bunny trail that? exists in the title of that project and its ties to some pre-existing adventures oh, that we may have been on Midnight mass oh, beautiful beautiful midnight mass is the book that maddie wrote in hush i fully expect that 
you know, all of the fans of the Flanniverse, someone's got to create the gift where Sarah says, I loved Riley. I love Aaron. Ah! I'm not going to give too much away, but that's going to be a really important like clip to have when this show comes out. Oh, that's so awesome. So let's get into the wonders of Bly. First of all, congratulations on this piece. And coming off yes. this incredible world you're a part of building with Hill House and, and pushing yourself to new limits as a performer, perhaps even to unheard of limits by a cast in the history of a televised narrative even. It was also a very formative time in the discovery of talent like Victoria Pedretti and the creation of new friendships. What was the creative energy like going into Bly and how long in between was there, was there any sort of break in between the two projects? Well, for me, um, between the end of Hill House and the beginning of Bly, I had my baby girl. I had Theodora Flanagan. And um, so I kind of was outside of that whole world. Having a baby is a gravity well in itself. Like it just sucks you in. And like, it's the only thing you think about or want to talk about or want to do or want to eat. Like you just want to eat this baby. Maybe that's just me. Um, Triscuits, we eat babies. Um, But... What was interesting is that when Bly started, the mechanism started rolling. um, I kept sitting there just really wanting to play, feeling like I had been put on the bench, like I had been benched for this season. And I thought, you know what? They're not even going to use me because I have a baby and they have all these incredible cast members to use. And they brought in all these brand new, beautiful cast members. And when Mike let me know and and Leah pitched episode eight to me, I, I like a big drama queen. I cried because I was like, I get to play. I get to go in, put me in, coach. I get it. Not only do you get a play, you get to play in these amazing costumes. Oh my wow. gosh. Were those wow. vintage or did they make them by hand? That is seven hot couture gowns made by Lynn Falconer and team. They are full corseted. They brought in a corseter. I have one of them that um, I would go get now, but then my child would know where I am. And right. then- <laughs> But um, they are built to my body and they are in storage. It is an insane thing. We're hoping to get some pictures of them so that people can see them up close because truly, truly beautiful constructed out of whole cloth gowns. Oh, my God. Have an episode title like the romance of certain old clothes. Really got to lean into that. And Lynn did. And it was really impressive. Oh, yes. Well, that's the other thing, right? That episode, it is in black and white. So you uh, do, right? You do lose a lot of that, yeah. that color. I mean, it, sh- it looks spectacular in black and white. But what was the thought process in having that shifted to black and white when you have all these amazing things and details that might not go noticed? Well, I don't know. Like, um, I'm not part of the inner workings of the behind the scenes of the decision to make it black and white. But what I did, what I for my own performance was I thought to myself like, well, I'm a story within a story, right? So we're another level removed and that kind of highlights it. It pulls us out one more time so that you understand that this is sort of a parable of the whole experience of Bly. This is the the fairy tale of Viola and Perdita and why the ghosts exist. And I think that was really helpful for the audience because it immediately tells them we're somewhere else and we're doing something else. So (laughs) you also directing this episode, all the different episodes have different directors. We've got Liam Gavin from a dark song, which is a film that you led us to discover, which is, Oh my God, one of our favorites. It's so amazing. It's so amazing. And then for episode eight, you have Axel Carolyn, who's worked on tales of Halloween. Also a script writer for chilling adventures of Sabrina talk about working with her why she was chosen in particular for this project Mike believed correctly that this decidedly female story needed a female director and Axel is an up and coming amazing voice with like a very strong vision which is important for this episode and Axel shows up with just like piles and piles of inspirational images from old movies and like we were talking about old Nosferatu images and how we wanted the monster of Viola to look and move and sound that like breathing noise of like old monster movies and I think without that level and and vision the episode doesn't work at all because she not only had that, she had a joy every time she showed up to work. She was full of joy to be there. We were all dancing and singing and like we just could not have been having more fun. We, um, as you know, they transformed Blind Manor into the, the time of the episode. 
but they didn't have to change all the rooms. And so one of the rooms that didn't get changed was Miles's bedroom. And so they used that for actor staging. And sometimes between setups, me and Katie Parker and Axel would just pile into the bed and like read scary stories and like tell each other ghost stories. And like, this is pre COVID. So we could just like hug. And those are some of my favorite memories. I have a handful of those pictures. I'm going to post later on. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> yeah. And you're, you're the makeup look, you know, when you caught the lung and you start getting the shadow on your face it does have that nosferatu almost like barbara steel look it looks so yes. cool such a yeah. harkening back old, to those old horror old monsters speaking of the lung how crazy that Bly in this episode all of a sudden becomes a center for quarantine, not only for the characters in the story, but the whole like city, everybody around gravitates to Bly in a time of quarantine. Yeah. Was that it was any of that tweaked in post-production to add some elements of that voiceover that we talk about and some of the things that some of the things that Carla Gugino says in the narrative speaks so incredibly precise to what's going on? I don't think so. I believe that that was as written and it was just like a, a precognition of the writers. Maybe something was like beamed in very quickly and they got that feeling that like this is this is something we should talk about. Because we were wrapped and done way before this was even a thing. Unbelievable. Leo, you had a question. Jump in, man. Yeah, working with Axel, what was your favorite scene to shoot? And what were some of the challenges in filming your scenes in episode eight? Oh, God, Axel. Oh, the one I love so much is, oh, Axel came up with this brilliant idea, which is that when we are miming things and we are having a conversation, you can't use your mouth. No one is mouthing words. So, and it felt so weird to do. It was just like, and it was such a, a leap of faith because I trusted her so much, but I was like, this is going to be weird, Axel. Like, this isn't going to work. She's like, it's going to work. It's going to work. And so we watched playback on the first day and it looks so much like a fairy tale, like lovely black and white um, mosaic that I just I think she's a genius, but there's one where Katie and I are in bed and we're kneeling um, in profile and she has a candle and I'm telling her the plan about Arthur and keeping Bly Manor. And we went at that over and over and over again with Jimmy Neist, our DP, to get that very specific gothic look. And I was so impressed. I was so impressed because, you know, a newer director sometimes won't drill down like that. And she was doing it all the time. There's a great shot of Perdita dead in front of my trunk with her neck up and it's sort of shot from below. And that's from a specific painting, like an old time painting or an image. And the time Axel would spend just to craft these visual experiences. She's just, mm, mm. She's just queen. She queen. I love it. I love it. Leo, follow it up with your nice. next one, man. You had another one. Yeah, I know. I also noticed an Easter egg, like the room Pedretti stays in at the hostel. Uh, can we expect many more in the series? Like, say, maybe the Oculus Mirror, perhaps? Um, I know there are tons of Easter eggs. Unfortunately, I can't give them any away because I wasn't on set that much. And so... I would suggest that people inundate Mike Flanagan with tweets. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming. It's At coming. Mike Flanagan film. Now, again, we mentioned that voiceover that Carla Gugino just kills it with the voiceover, in particular in this episode. I mean, don't you just want Carla Gugino to read you bedtime stories? I know. Oh gosh, I know. I so right? do. Ugh, Does any of that stuff, was any of that stuff present on set for you that, to inform your performance? I mean, in those scenes where she would sleep, she would walk, she would wake. Mm -hmm there were times where I needed to match up timing. And so um, our script supervisor would read them who, who is not necessarily as talented as Carla Gugino. <laughs> and so, um, but there was a certain number of things, my death, we had to have the voiceover playing so that it timed out perfectly to when they get to, and the word was enough. That's when the action started. Um, when I'm in the room, uh, when I'm looking at myself in the mirror, I asked them to read me about like she she finally accepted that she was dead. And then da, 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 da. that to me was really moving. I thought the language of the episode was so beautiful that sometimes it definitely helped the performance. Yeah, your character, Viola, is such a strong, fierce and intelligent woman. She has such heart, too. Are there any characteristics in Viola that you find in yourself? I certainly wouldn't tell you that Mike said that the whole point of being stubborn was because he knew I couldn't play someone who wasn't just bullheaded. It radiates from my human. 
I am sing when I have a goal, I just won't stop. It's very, very bad. It's very bad. And so all of my characters have to have that because it's one of those things I can't stop um, pouring out of every single pore. I think Viola's commitment to her family is something I really identified with. I think her love of fancy clothes, I certainly, certainly identified with. Um, yeah, I think Viola's probably closer to me than I'd care to admit. <laughs> I'm not going to murder everyone I love with my own yeah. gravity belt. <laughs> Besides I, that. If I got thrown in a lake. If I got thrown in a lake, who knows what I would do? It was also the first time I believe we've heard you sing on screen. I believe with the Baroque hit, Till My Lover Returns to Me. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Did Mike yeah, write that song? <laughs> Did Mike write that song or was it actually like a, like a classic song you had to learn? I think he wrote it. I don't know. What I got from him was a voice memo of him singing it. No way! <laughs> Special <Nice>. feature. <laughs> yes. I'm gonna come for it, but maybe I'll post it. But because I was, he like sent me the music link, and I was like, Mike, Mike, I'm not gonna. Ah, there's a baby screaming at me. Just, just sing it, and I'll learn it like I learn a lullaby. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's, that's great. I, <laughs> I mean, one thing that I got to speak on, too, is that the Newton brothers killed it on episode yes. eight yes. to see yes. them perform in this lush kind of period with the main theme and yeah. changing and that amazing waltz They're that happens. So yeah. Beautiful. Oh, my so beautiful. gosh. They're so I love them so completely. God, you love fast grows. Now, what about some of the challenges of doing? I mean, the water scenes, how much of that was like, how did that happen? Dude, dude. Dude, I mean, I, um, <laughs> there's a lot of ways I could go with this. Do you guys want an upbeat, happy story? Or do you want like a, <laughs> I want, I want, the, truth. want the truth. Story? The truth. <laughs> so I guess the truth is somewhere in between. So when I was younger, instead of having dreams about flying, I had dreams about breathing underwater. Still to this day, that's like my freedom dreams are me breathing underwater. So I was super stoked. And um, there was an amazing underwater team. And we went to the aquatic center in Vancouver and they put the wig on me because the wig adds so much weight to your head that it needed I needed to practice with that and I had a full scuba suit on and I learned to scuba and they taught me all of these meditation techniques and now I can hold my breath for two minutes at a time and so because two things happen when you get in that lake so there's two ways it was shot like the happy happy version is the tank work which is where it's like a nice tank of warm water and they've dressed it like a happy aquarium and there this there's the underwater filming department all in their scuba gear and they put me in my dress and my wig and the everything and they sew weights into the dress so i lay flat on the bottom of the lake and somebody comes and gives me a breath and then everybody floats away and we wait for about two minutes or more while the bubbles settle and then someone says over a speaker, underwater speaker, open your eyes, close your eyes, open your eyes, close your eyes. And that is so much fun. It is. It's so fun because you're just like breathing underwater and it's beautiful and warm. And then there's the freaking lake, the actual lake in Langley, Vancouver in November. That's freezing cold and it's three in the morning. And I don't know if you noticed this, but your girl came out of perfectly still water. So I am again, I've got my weights and I've got my wig and they've got me in like this nude colored scuba suit because it's freezing cold. Like things are freezing. They're breaking up ice on the surface of this lake and they're trying to heat it, but they can't because they have to get what anyway. And I'm in this thing and I'm shaking and I'm shaking and I'm shaking so hard. And, and then they go, OK, here we go. And I have to go underwater and I hold on to these two sandbags and I have to hold my breath until the lake is perfectly still. Oh, and my then God. oh, wow. I have to walk out of the lake perfectly smoothly to a point like a, a specific point, because that's the only place the ramp is for me to walk out of the lake. I can't see anything. I'm in a lake, y'all. Like I can't open my eyes underwater. So I'm slowly dropping these um, these sandbags and walking smoothly. And I've done it two or three times. And I am so cold. I am I am bone deep shaking just miserable, just ready to quit my entire dream because I'm like, I can't do this. And I go under and I do it again and it works and it's great. And I hear from the, the tent where they keep all the people who are watching the screen to make sure the costume and the hair looks right. Um, someone yell, I think a little bit more of your hair needs to be in front of your shoulders. And oh. I, lost I, lost oh. I, like, I don't know. <laughs> to move my hair in front of my shoulders because I'm holding sandbags and my whole body 
And at that point, Axel comes out and she's like, okay, I think we're done. I think we've got it. This is great. Thank you. Thank you. And I just like burst into tears. Wow. And I love Lilia. Lilia is doing my hair for Midnight Mass. Like we're friends. So it was fine. But it was one of those moments where I think sometimes we forget that there are people playing these characters. And what about the prosthetic? Was what about the prosthetic look when your face starts to tear? Was that all digital? Was there any prosthesis? That's digital. There okay. were dots on my face for some of it, and some of it is a stand-in done by Daniela Dib, who is an amazing uh, actress in her own right and stunt woman. And she did some of that, and she had to wear the silicone mask. Oh wow! Please tell me those paintings are at your house of you. I just got one. Yeah! It's over, yes! Yes! And it's over Mike's office desk. Oh, yes! That's really nice. rad. <laughs> to you, what does Bly speak to on a whole? From the beginning to end, in your words, what do you think it speaks to on a whole? I've always thought that, and everyone has been saying this, and I hope it doesn't get redundant, but I think Bly is a love story and not one of those like fancy free love stories that that teach our kids all the wrong things. I think it's a love story about what love actually is in all of its different ways. And it's not just about the love between you and your romantic partner. It's about the love between sisters, the love between friends, the love between Jamie and her plants. Like it's about all the different types of love and the way those loves can go terribly well and the way they can go terribly wrong. Beautifully said. Thank you so much. And again, congratulations on Bly and pass that along to Mike for us. I sure will. If I ever see him again. (laughs) 